welcome to the 19th episode of the fifth season of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Tuesday the 6th of November and in this episode we are going to chat about last week's UDS and interview Dirk Gorison about random hacks of kindness. We will of course cover the latest news, events, bit about Ubuntu, tomorrow's technology today and go over your feedback. If you're listening live, you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I'm Mark, and joining me tonight are, making a triumphant return to the show, Alan. Yay! Tony. Hello. Yay. Good evening. And Laura. Yay! <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to sound less enthusiastic there. So, Alan, what have you been up to in your extended though. absence? Uh, drinking beer in Copenhagen. That sounds expensive. expensive. <laughs> yes, it is. We got the bill today. <laughs> <laughs> How much was a pint of lager? Uh, it was about five pounds uh, for a pint of Carlsberg. So <laughs> it's not even something they imported. It's, <laughs> they, they, did. they make it down the road. And, right. Uh, yeah. Wow. Well, they probably wow. did make it over here and send it over there. Did you see any murders? In Copenhagen? There's apparently a lot there. Really? Have you Golly. not watched The Killing? No. Is that on telly? Oh, dear. <laughs> no. Yeah. So, yeah, I've been in Copenhagen for two weeks. So, um, that was fun. What, what were you doing in Copenhagen? Uh, we'll talk more about that later. Oh, shall we? Yeah, okay, let's do that. Tony, right, what right. have you been up to? Um, we went on a uh, on a little bit of a weekend jaunt with uh, friends of the show, Neil Here and Amy go. Ferguson. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> there it is. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so we had a nice time out and uh, we uh, went to Monkey World and went to a fireworks display and saw some tanks. And you went to Monkey Oh, did you go World. to the Tank Museum? We did we go did. to the Tank Museum, yes. Oh, and, I've uh, been there. Did they do an outside display of tank manoeuvres and stuff? Yes. yes. Big tanks going around in the dark, which was slightly um, boring. <laughs> 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 and, uh, you could just hear them coming. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> And um, an answer. Yes. And we also played with my monster 14 inch. Um, <laughs> 14 inch sparklers, some of which I have here. <laughs> yes. Which wow. are quite impressive, aren't they? Great. And there you go. Oh, well, that, what you used to make your photos with rude words and add people's names. We uh, didn't write rude uh, words. Yeah. I think that was entirely Neil. Oh, okay. Indeed. Discreet veil drawn over that. Lovely. Okay. How about you, Laura? I fixed my boots with Sugru. Ooh, is this Again? that weird pasty no. stuff that Alan bought some of? Yes. Yes. Uh, and what would happen to your boot? Laura holds up the boot to yes. Mark. Yes, Laura, Laura's now showing, showing us her boot and pointing at the wow. heel. I can't see where you repaired that. That looks awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure it's switched on? I can't hear a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it's not butter. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I've not tried them out yet. Was there a hole there or something? Yes. Um, or did you drill a hole just so you could <laughs> just sort of fill use it. some sugru? Now the so- the sole of, is very thin, and mm-hmm. and for some reason the back of the fabric then kind of overhangs slightly, and if the ground's uneven, it's worn away. Oh. So basically, I extended the sole backwards. Oh. Wow. Yeah, on. it looks all right. So I'll see how well it well, works. Yeah, it didn't look weird. No. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good. A bonus. <laughs> so yes. Mark, what about you? Uh, I bought a new laptop. Ooh. Yes, is that, it, is that shiny. one there? It's very it, nice. It's the one I have on my it's knee. It's like here. a wedge of cheese. It, it, it's cheese? quite quite wedge shaped. It's actually a bit of an optical illusion. Mark holds it's, microphone uh, laptop up to microphone. If you look at, if you look at his side <laughs> on, it's, it's all not about actually, the visuals tonight. It's not actually as as wedge shaped as it looks, but it is very visually appealing. It is, yeah, it's, it's very, very nice. nice. But yeah, yeah, basically my my Asus EPC, which I've had for many many years, um, has sort of given up the ghost. So I needed something new and portable. So I bought myself a, um, a Asus ZenBook, which is very nice and thin. What size screen is it? Uh, 13 and a bit inches, I believe. What does it run? Uh, it's currently running Ubuntu Quantal. Ooh. 1210. 1210, the latest and possibly greatest. Does it work? It works like a charm. Excellent. Yeah. Awesome. All the buttons work? Um, except for the brightness... Up and down buttons for some reason. You can you can it control. It does look quite dull. You can control the brightness. Oh, yeah, I can I can turn the brightness up. I just can't turn the brightness up with the buttons on the keyboard. <laughs> Sounds great. They, they, they is, there a, is there a fix or bug for that? Um, I believe that. Yeah, well, I, I've. This isn't Tarno. <laughs> no, this is this is yeah. Um, I I reported a bug on for uh, for a separate bug which has just been confirmed today. Although I know that that's fixed in the latest kernel, um, which isn't on that machine. No. So the, the latest the latest kernel um, that's in development for Raring, so 3.7 RC3, fixes some bugs, but currently introduces some others. So Awesome. Brilliant. Hopefully, with the next version of Ubuntu, it will be working nicely, but everything that I need works. 
So That's I good. have no Sweet. complaints it's at nice all. It's a nice looking laptop. It is. <laughs> So uh, in between drinking beer, expensive beer in Copenhagen, there was also uh, some time spent at the Ubuntu Developer Center. Ah, right, okay. Yes. Um, and uh, it was four days uh, this year, uh, and so there was lots of stuff packed into those four days. Right. Loads of sessions, as we usually do, loads of one-hour blocks throughout the four days, uh, loads of different tracks, and um, loads of stuff to go to, and in between me doing you know other real work i i would manage to get catch a few uh sessions at uds and um yeah i've noted down a few of them here and thought we could have a little chat about some of them okay so what were the big themes at uds this time around so one of the big themes was um gaming um with the announcement of steam for linux coming and um and also with uh some reports that that um ubuntu 1210 and 1204 haven't been great for gamers in terms of video and audio performance and um and other things um they actually scheduled a whole bunch of sessions throughout the week um about ubuntu as a gaming platform and um address uh, started talking about all the specific issues that we have uh, in ubuntu and why those problems are there and how we can go about fixing them or mitigating them and and also how we can get those fixes back into the lts release so rather than just say right. well let's fix that in 1304 actually get those fixes into the lts especially given that Valve have said Steam will be targeted for 1204. Mm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's loads of interesting sessions on that. Cool. cool. So what things are going to be done in terms of graphics and sound fixes? So there's some there's some ongoing work on uh, Compiz, mm. um, something called unredirected windows, which is, yes, all very complicated. I've heard that term before. I did understand it once. Yes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> it all makes sense when they explain it and then yeah. <laughs> the What's information falls for? out of my head. Uh, it's so you can get um, good graphics performance uh, and kind of like throw away the, the, the desktop while you're running a full screen right, game yes. kind of thing. Uh, so okay. you're not wasting CPU cycles doing desktop-y stuff while there's a game running. Right. Which makes total sense. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Um, but we haven't had that enabled. It's possible to enable it and the code is there, but we haven't had it enabled by default because when you enable it by default, um, it, it uncovers bugs in the video drivers. Right. So, you know, there was then a lengthy discussion about, you know, what do we do about that? Do we enable this and just say, you know, go for it, enable it. And if you have a problem, you know, you have to disable it um, and, you know, maybe put out newer video drivers for those that we can um, or maybe have an option where they can turn it on or off, you know, more easily than being buried somewhere in, you know, Gconf or Compiz Config Settings Manager or something like that. So so there was there was talk about, you know, how we fix the things and also how we, bring the settings to the surface that people need in order to enable or disable the stuff that you know matters to them mm -hmm. okay um what about things like the uh, fantastic shopping lens was that discussed at all <laughs> yes that that was a topic of conversation yeah. uh, at uds we actually scheduled a session because um you know there's been a lot of press about the shopping lens um yeah. and other not things. all a bit positive. No, no, not at all. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, a little bit from column A, a little bit from column B. <laughs> um, yeah, so we had some sessions on um, um, on r things related to that. So not, not just the shopping lens itself. There was things like uh, the release process and how the fact that the shopping lens landed really, really late in the cycle mm -hmm. meant yes. that it wasn't tested as thoroughly as it could have been yeah meant that um we didn't have a, an option to disable it straight away and that mm. was created very quickly mm -hmm. um which obviously wasn't tested as well as it could be if it had landed much earlier in the cycle yeah um so those kind of issues which are relating to the shopping lens but are not unique to the shopping lens no, I was because say, a lot of those sound like they could have been rehearsed before yeah, um, and, previous kind of things that have landed late. Yeah, and and other stuff landed late as well. It wasn't just the shopping lens that landed late. We had mm. a whole bunch of feature freeze exceptions, um, and we had you know, lengthy discussions with the release team about how we go about um, not doing that next time. You know, not not having things land really late in the cycle, um, having things more thoroughly tested before they do land, um, and also changing the sh the schedule completely. So. 
um, actually, there's going to be more time for the developers to finish their work. So it's a it's a it's um it's a it's a process that that isn't just don't land stuff late. Mm. It's don't land stuff late. But I'll tell you what, we'll give you a bit more time to do it. So next time around, you know, you're less likely to land it late anyway. Mm. So are things landing late just because that's when they get finished, or is there a certain amount of time for PR or? Um, so in the last cycle, the main reason why this, the the stuff landed late, the shopping lens, was because that it was um, the specification was was finished late, oh, and right, the development yeah. was done late. Mm. So there was a short sprint with, where the the final bits of the shopping lens were created, and that was done really really late in the cycle, and not very long before it landed in the district. Yeah. And it was you know it was it was seen as an important thing to land in this release so that we could get it well tested. Um, and you know, one of the problems is if we leave it until the next release and we put it into raring, we'll have another six months where nobody is testing it or only a very small number of people are testing it. Cause it's relatively speaking, it's a very small number of people who run the development release. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So getting it into the distro, okay. Gives us a bit of flack and we get a load of feedback about it and we can improve that for next time. Mm. And we can also, you know, fix the bugs that there are with it in the current release. Um, but it also means we actually get the thing tested well. So this approach of not having alphas and pushing back the feature freeze, uh, is that a good thing? Is it going to help just by not having alphas? People so, often waited to the first alpha before they downloaded it yeah. and tested it. Yeah, the, the alphas were a kind of checkpoint and at which people would say, okay, alpha one is out, now I'm going to start testing the development release yeah. mm-hmm. or when or some people waited for the beta um or maybe even later um w- one of the problems with doing those um alphas and betas is we have freezes for the week beforehand uh, so having a freeze multiple times throughout a very short six month cycle yeah yeah when you know the, there's a feature freeze that comes you know a little while before release you've actually got a very short window in which you can do work and short bursts in which you can land things in in the distro. So by wiping out those freezes, so we've got continuous development going on throughout the cycle, people can constantly keep iterating over their development and they don't have to stop developing something or rush something to get it in before alpha or whatever freeze is upcoming. Does that make sense? Yeah, mm. so is it is there going to be a kind of still a kind of point in time where things should be over the initial crazy release <laughs> so not, where people can be a bit confident that it's a kind of like an alpha yeah i think what we'll do is probably have some publicity ar- around the point at which you would normally have an alpha yeah and and maybe we might have what you might call a soft freeze so we might say okay we're, we're going to say that this one on this day we've thoroughly tested and we've gone through a two-week testing cycle for that image that's the one we're gonna we're gonna say Go for, go for broke on that one, and everyone start testing that 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 image. Um, it won't be you know an alpha, but you can kind of think of it like an alpha. Yeah, because I mean, from a development point of view, it'd be quite nice to know that you can produce an image that's tested, yeah. where everything more or less has yeah. a chance of working. And, it, and in fact, related to that, what what we are doing is it's uh, changing the way stuff lands in the distro so that it is much more thoroughly tested before it even lands in mm. distro. Um, something we're specifically doing with unity is um in the last release with unity we would uh have developers working on it and then we would say okay let's freeze uh the unity trunk and we'll package that up and we'll do a release so we would had you know 6.10 6.12 you know 6.14 these these releases of unity what we're going to do now is each time a developer checks in their code, it goes through an intensive set of testing and makes sure that it works and it doesn't break anything else mm-hmm. um, and lands in a, a PPA that means it's all packaged so we know the packaging works and then some more testing on uh, actual machines, physical machines, before it semi-automatically lands in the distro in theory the next day. Mm but could be the day after. So so there isn't going to be a development for a week and then uh, we work on a, for a couple of days packaging it up and then Unity yeah. lands in, in the distro. It's going to be, you know, you work on Monday and you know what, what you did on Monday will be on people's desktops on Wednesday. Mm. Yeah, that's good. And so then if someone's, if someone's running the development release, the idea is that when they hit 
upgrade each day and it pulls in all the new packages that should never then they should never then have a situation where they reboot and suddenly x they doesn't don't get work x or something. yeah, yeah or, exactly. that's exactly yeah. the kind of situation we want to avoid is is also you know one package breaking another yeah so there's going to be lots of additional testing being done um before it lands in distro mm. to do things like um do reverse depends uh, checking to make sure that none of the packages that we depend on yeah. for this package get broken so it's not just checking each atomic package on its own it checks everything that it depends on as well which is an awful lot of testing there's a lot uh. of infrastructure going in place to get all that working right now mm. um but it's uh it's a huge amount of testing that gets done before it even lands anywhere near people's machines cool. um there was a a bit of a sort of semi announcement before the before UDS actually started some some rumors and videos flying around the internet about um the Nexus 7, and uh, how Ubuntu appeared to be coming to the Nexus 7. Do you want to tell us a bit about what happened? <laughs> it's here, it's now, it's ready, it's out, everybody can use oh, it, and it's wonderful. Brilliant. That's what I believe. <laughs> <laughs> but you won't that's, be getting one. That's my understanding of the uh, press release that was put out. So at the sprint, the week before UDS, yeah. we, we were all holed up in a room, and there was a team who were working on getting Ubuntu working on a touch device. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it, the device they chose was the Nexus 7 because it's relatively inexpensive. It's a, it's a known device, and yeah. we know we can put Ubuntu on it. Um, and, um, you know, it's a pretty flexible kind of device, and it's common, you know, around the world. You can very, very easily get hold of one. Not because we want to put Ubuntu on tablets as such, and this isn't Ubuntu for tablets. Right. This is Ubuntu on a tablet form factor so that we can see... Um, if how well the core works right. on a tablet. So, so for this example, is things like does do like does running Unity sap all the battery and kill it? Uh, not well, not really. It's lower than that. It's more, um, you know, how does the core use battery? So you know, things like Bluetooth does that is that going to eat the battery up? Right. And you know, all the other um, system services that start up. Do we really need all of them? Mm-hmm. All these various um, processes that you get out of the box when you when you do a clean install of Ubuntu, do they really need to be there? And could they be rewritten in a more efficient wa- manner? Mm-hmm. And in fact, we had one of the sessions, which was probably the most packed uh, session of the whole of UDS, was a load of people came into the room, most of them branding, uh, brandishing a, um, a Nexus 7, which had already had Ubuntu flashed on it. Right. Um, and sat there um, asking questions they like boot it up and then run top and then asking the questions okay what is this process why is it running why have i got one why is it eating 50 meg of ram and then <laughs> yeah like building up a profile of those those processes cool. which we we haven't usually worried about so much because people have you know i7 like yeah. 8 yeah. gig of ram and yeah. this thing's only got one gig of ram i think i think it's got one gig you think so um and a small yeah. amount of storage so yeah. we have to start worrying about these things yeah. if we're ever gonna bring out a tablet which marcus said you know by 1404 we'll have phones and tablets so Mm -hmm. if we're going to do that we need to start looking at these things it's more of those kind of core things so people like colin king has been he's written scripts he works on the kernel team for canonical he's written scripts that do intensive testing and he's had uh one of these sat on his desk um and he's been uh running all four cores at full tilt for as long as he can to see how many hours of battery life he gets Mm -hmm. out of it i think he gets something like seven to ten hours or something really which is which is impressive yeah um, I've been getting five hours out of mine, <laughs> but I think I haven't got the latest updates. That, right. that they, and, and so they're putting all these up, all these things they're learning, they're putting into a PPA. Yeah. Um, they're not going straight into the distro yet because we need to prove it all mm-hmm. on this device. And then once we've proved it all, we can then put all those into the distro so that if people did want to put it on a tablet, they're going to have a better experience than they do right now. Mm-hmm. Cool. So um, you've, you've got an Nexus 7 there with Ubuntu on it. Yes. What's it like? Um, so there's a few bugs. Um, it's not powered up at the moment. Oh. <laughs> I can power up, though. That's kind of a look. Out on the Waves tablet at Laura. It doesn't take long to boot. Hmm. Um, so there are a number of bugs. And the good thing is we're filing all those bugs. In fact, most of the bugs had already been filed before the announcement was made because yeah. the guys who were building the image were already filing the bugs as they went. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's, there's a few kind of rather nasty ones like um, uh, the left mouse button gets stuck down sometimes that's one finger tap yes yeah <laughs> so you you tap and then you can't tap anything else yeah <laughs> things like that that's, that's a, a bit, bit of, of a pain. problem yeah but um and there's other like desktop type things but those aren't the things we're yeah most interested but in they're sort of things that you have to fix so that you can test all the rest exactly yeah. exactly right 
And the on-screen keyboard is amusing. The one we've got is the default Ubuntu one on, yeah. on board. And the initial te- um, version that we put on there, um, the theme uh, consumed a vast amount of CPU because it has, <laughs> um, it has these gradients on the keys. Oh, right. And that was eating all the CPU. So it's learning about things like that. We never even knew that that was eating CPU. Yeah. And that will be eating CPU on people's yeah. laptops as well. well. So, you know, we're learning stuff about Ubuntu that because we're putting it on a a device like this and because everyone has exactly the same device yes it means it's very easy for us to reproduce bugs on mm. you know two tablets which are exactly the same cool okay and very quickly there are some plenaries that you might want to uh, tell us how exciting they were <laughs> <laughs> yeah there were a whole bunch of those at lunchtime each day uh, or just after lunch each day we go back into the the main room and we had a bunch of plenaries the there eventually i think they'll all be up on the youtube channel ubuntu developers um uh, but they were live streamed at the time, so you may already have seen some of these. Um, probably the most interesting one for me, one uh, Drew Bliss from uh, Valve Software. Mm, yeah, I watched that. He, he came along to all of the Ubuntu as a gaming platform sessions at UDS. It was really good getting loads of insight about how Valve make software and how they test it and mm-hmm. how they you know, check that games get the most frames per second and all that kind of, kind of good stuff that we're going to need to do. Yeah. Uh, so that was a good one. Uh, Chris Kenyon, um, VP of sales uh, at Canonical, um, gave a talk about how we're doing in terms of selling machines with Ubuntu pre-installed. And uh, that was, went down rather well. Uh, cool. Good numbers. And uh, one of the, the interesting points that he um, that seems to have been picked up by some people is, in I think he said in 2011, we shipped as many PCs running Ubuntu as Apple shipped Macs in around 2008, 2007. Which means okay. yeah, we're yeah. behind them, but we're not far behind yeah. them. Absolutely. Yeah. Barely four or five years yeah. behind them. <laughs> which is pretty good. And finally, there was a good yes. one from uh, Evan Dandria, who, um, along with uh, Matthew Paul Thomas, uh, main people behind the Whoopsie uh, app that crashes to Canonical so, oh, they, yes. can, uh, mm-hmm. so they can analyze them and, uh, and try and fix them. Um, errors.ubuntu.com is interesting to look at. And he gave a great long talk about uh, how it all fits together, how it works, and some of the plans for the future in making error reporting uh, more seamless and um, and less invasive for the user. Cool. Excellent. Well, it sounds like all that beer was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, needed it after all of that. <laughs> Now it's time for some news. Microsoft has launched Windows 8, the latest version of its desktop operating system that's now also aimed at tablets and other hybrid hybrid touchscreen devices. Has, has anyone tried it? it? <laughs> one of my colleagues uh, bought two licenses for it at the weekend. Um, that's keen. One for a laptop and one for... Apparently the licenses are really cheap for Windows now. They're like 30 quid or something silly. Huh. Yeah. But yeah, so he was playing with it. Thirty pounds more than Ubuntu. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've seen um, a number of reviews uh, over the last like forty-eight hours, mm-hmm. where people have um, had a real go at the performance of uh, Windows RT, RT on on tablets. Oh, the, on the ARM surface. version. The yes. ARM version. Yeah, mm-hmm. like someone showing typing yeah, in Word. I've seen some. Yeah, Word seems to be up. a real a real problem on the on the Surface yeah. tablet. It's the first version of a Windows on an ARM device for yeah. ever, I think. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, cut them well, some slack and I'm sure they'll fix those things. Do you think it'll be able to take on Ubuntu? No, cut them no slack. <laughs> they should have it right there, <laughs> Microsoft. Did you say do you think you could take on Ubuntu on tablets, given we don't <laughs> have a tablet yet? Yeah. I think Can that... you install Windows on a Nexus 7? <laughs> I think not. <laughs> Uh, Kim.com, the former owner of Mega Upload, prior to seizures of his assets by the New Zealand police that were later deemed illegal, is launching a new file storage and sharing site called Mega. The new site will encrypt all files stored using keys that only the user has access to. .com's hope is that this security model will absolve the company of responsibility over the content of the user's files. Let's Good hope luck. so. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't that all of those um, those upload sites tend to tend to be used? I'm generalising slightly here by people who want to share files with other people, not necessarily people putting a file up that they want to then get back later on. Mm. So they would need to share those keys somehow or have multiple. Yeah, but the the company would never need to have the key. Which right. is the point? Ah, because then yes. they can't say. No one can say to them, "Ah, you know what's in that file. You should take it down, or right. you should let people share it." Right. Because and it, nobody else could get. But the, hmm, 
But the problem is that I could share a file. I could put a, a file, a, a file that's encrypted with a key. Yep. Share the key on the internet with you, yep. and someone from like one of the copyright legislation people could could see that key in you know an IRC channel or on a web page listing of stuff, and then download the file and know that that file is is what it is. You that's know. true. You have to be careful with your keys. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Fun times. Processor manufacturer AMD has announced that it will, it will be selling 64-bit ARM processors from 2014, breaking the company's history of exclusively making x86 architecture processors <laughs> and giving a new dimension to the company's rivalry with Intel. Huh? Because Intel doesn't make ARM processors and isn't planning to, apparently. Yeah. Then this is the first kind of big chip manufacturer to do ARM well, well like, yes, no. you say big chip <laughs> manufacturer. Think how many ARM chips are made. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yes. What, what, the first... def- what defines ARM? They're, they're licensed by it. So ARM is a company that designs the the, the chip, mm. uh, but doesn't actually manufacture them. And oh, then other okay. companies like TI um, will license the design and then create their own chip. Mm. Mm. And ARM is a... Uh, a risk architecture, so it's lower power because it has a smaller instruction set. Mm. Yes. <laughs> uh, Wayland, the windowing system aimed at X11, has released version 1.0. While not ready to replace X11, the milestone represents a stable API for the system, guaranteeing backwards compatibility for future releases. Mm. Mm. Which is nice. There we go. Mm. Good progress. Windows Live Messenger, formerly MSN Messenger, looks set to be retired in favour of Skype. It's a good thing. Aww. Is it a good thing or not? I mean, it's not just in favour of a non-free thing. But it was was a non-free thing replaced by a non-free thing that runs on Linux. It reminded me that Microsoft on Skype, which was a bit sad. You did used to be able to get open (laughs) source. Sad face. You Mm -hmm. could get open source MSN clients. Yes. I still have one. Empathy and... Yeah. 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 But you can't get an open source Skype client. Well, well, you, you can, get can. An open so- you can get an open source front end which connects through the proprietary client. Yeah, well, it connects through the libraries. Yeah, there's an API, isn't there? It can make you feel better. Every yeah. everyone I've run had to have Skype running anyway. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, Valve Software have just announced the availability of the closed Steam for Linux beta. Over sixty thousand people requested access to the beta, which currently includes around two dozen games ported over natively to Linux. Yay! Yay! Are you excited by this? Yeah, look at that. Doesn't it look good? Alan holds up laptop. <laughs> what is hold, that? I'll hold my laptop to the, to the microphone there. Can you see Alan that? has the Steam Beta. <laughs> Bit closer. Are you Mark one of the, doesn't have the Steam Beta. Are you one of the face. lucky few? Alan? Lucky thousand or so people who have it. Out of 60,000 yeah. who replied, apparently. Uh, well, yeah. yeah. Apparently the emails are going out now um, in batches. They're not sending them all out. So don't be worried if you did sign up and you haven't got an email yet. You might get it. Or you might not. They're doing a mail merge, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Excel does take its time. And that's the end of the news. Hello, and welcome to Tomorrow's Technology Today. I'm Douglas Austin Cambridge. A good day to all our listeners wherever you are around the British Empire, or indeed Chipping Sodbury. And it's good day to my delightful bouncy rabbit, Miss Deirdre Morris Oxford. You're sounding rather more chipper than usual, Douglas. Uh, that's because I'm on medication, Deirdre. In the future, pharmaceutical science will be able to cure all sorts of behavioural conditions. Including congenital stupidity. Including congenital stupidity? What, what if it can you mean, Deirdre? So what exactly are you on, Douglas? It's called, let me see, lysergic acid diethylamide. LSD? Yes, my glorious fun bundle. Uh, Do mind your head on that flying elephant. Douglas? Why, Grandma, what big pink fluffy ears you have. Douglas? Yes, nurse? Where did you get your medication? Uh, From my very good friend, Dr. Aesop Spasm, a renowned expert in new therapies. According to the good doctor, by the end of the century, we'll all be popping pills like there's no tomorrow. Flumblehoop. And according to my good friend, Aldous Huxley, there may be no tomorrow if we're all medicated to the eyeballs. Eyeballs? I can see them. Eyeballs everywhere. Are you looking at me? Are you looking at me? Well, I don't see anyone else here. Douglas, it says on this bottle not to be taken with alcohol. That's all right, Deirdre. I've only had a couple of whiskies. Wibble. 
Douglas, you had a couple of whiskies for breakfast. What else have you taken? Mummy, I feel all lightheaded. Why is Teddy trying to strangle me? Douglas! Don't hit me, Father. I only took some Barbital, Mary Joanna, and some of your snuff. Mwahaha! <laughs> Wibble! Mwahaha! <laughs> Douglas! 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 That's all from tomorrow's technology today. Toodle Pip and God Save the King! I'm here with Dirk Gorison, who's taking part in an event called Random Hacks of Kindness. So, tell us all about Random Hacks of Kindness. Well, Random Hacks of Kindness, or ROC in short, was uh, set up a couple of years ago by Google, NASA, Yahoo, and a couple of others. And as a, as a forum, as an organization which would organize events um, worldwide, and the idea would be you bring together people from a programming, computer science, hacking background, together with people from international development, from NGOs, from the World Bank. And the idea would be, during these events, um, the, the, the software people, the programmers, would try to work on, on problems related to humanity, to, to international development, and try to do something for the, for the greater good. Okay, so this is the first one or a second one? How many times has it been run? Um, so ROC itself was established, I think, around four years ago, though I'm not quite sure. Uh, there are two global events every year. And every city anywhere or any place all over the world is free to host, uh, apply to host for an event. Um, so there's two every year. Um, we're in Southampton and I organized the first one in June, um, this, this past June, and I'm now organizing the next one in December. So it's the second event for Southampton, though previously I attended different rocks uh, in previous years. And I think there's one in Oxford as well in the UK? Um, not, as well, well, not for December, um, as far as I'm aware. They're, I've just found out, well, Exeter has uh, recently put an application, so they're running one as well. Okay, so uh, random hacks of kindness, it, it, that implies the sort of social good thing that you were talking about. Um, what sort of things do you work on over a weekend? Um, it can be quite a wide variety of problems. The, the main restriction is, of course, it has to be a problem which has some kind of social good or social value. So this can be... Um, for example, a local charity that works with Alzheimer's patients, and they need, for example, they could uh, they would need some kind of smartphone app to, to help with, with that, or or, or it could be uh, an NGO like Oxfam. This was at the Rock in Oxford last year, I think. Um, Oxfam they are launching a poster campaign, and they would like to have an idea. You know, is our poster campaign really having an impact? And how do we measure that? And how can we collect data around that? And we we'd like a website to visualize our different posters. Um, uh, it can be, we had uh, in, in June here in Southampton, we had a researcher from the geography department who had satellite images uh, taken uh, by NASA, and he was interested in, in extracting uh, what he called the normalized water difference index, I believe, which is a measure for the water content of plants. So given satellite images, run some post-processing to calculate the water, to estimate the water content in plants, and this can then be useful to farmers for irrigation and, and all kinds of things and tracking deforestation and things. Um, so what the team there did is they took, they wrote uh, a nice a nice website essentially it was based on Node.js and uh, on Mongo, which would pull in the satellite images, do the post-processing, generate this 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 uh, this statistic and present it nicely in a Google Maps type, uh, type environment and so you could, you know, it would be very easy to look up a portion of the world and see what, what the water content was there and then track it over time and, and they're still continuing with that. If you're an organisation and you have a problem like Oxfam, you want to obsess how useful your posters are or you're a researcher in geography and you want to find out how much water is in plants how do you get the people who come along to rock to work on your problem okay so what you first do is you find an event nearby uh, and there's, there's there's 20 or so over the world and shouldn't be too much of an issue and uh, then you well, what you need to do is you'd have to scope your problem so you'd have to essentially have to write up two or three paragraphs which is what the problem is about why it's important um, what kind of technology restrictions there are, if any. 
And you'd have to scope it in such a way that um, a team of three to four people can come to some kind of prototype in the, in the space of a weekend. So, it, you know, it can't be too ambitious, it can't solve the world's problems. But it should be possible to come together, to put together a prototype of the weekend. So if you, you know, if you can formulate a problem statement that fits within the social good scope, which is quite broad, and you can, you can, you know, you can write it down into paragraphs, uh, you can submit it to the location you're interested in. You just contact the organizer in Southampton, that would be me. And, uh, yeah, and then typically you would come pitch it on site in person. You can pitch through Skype or remotely, though typically we always encourage uh, people with problems to come physically on site. It just helps so much more. So you submit your problem to a specific event. So you would submit it, in this case, to Southampton, to your event. Yes, you can submit it to all events uh, and it just becomes one extra problem in the big problem database that Rock has but then it just tends to get drowned it's much much better to work with a local local event uh, you much more chance your problem will actually be worked on okay so who are the people that actually work on these problems over the course of a Rock event are they all developers are they computer scientists are they general geeks who turns up um, you get a very interesting mix of people. Now, the focus of hackathons, tip, historically, has always been on the programming side. So what you get is, you know, people typically are able to program in some form or manner. Although the experience varies. I've, I've had very, very new programmers who are just starting out. Um, so the, the heavy, most, the majority of the people are programmers or computer scientists or computer science students or researchers in that field. But you also have people like who more they're closer to the problem side, um, and they, you know, they have a background in, in you know, in, in international development, or maybe, maybe, or management, or the, the the softer side as well. They're more interested in, of course, the problem and different ways to solve that, not necessarily in producing code. But they can provide valuable feedback in how to manage things or problems on the field, and and give an extra dimension. What I'd like to do with this event is also broaden it a bit more, so you know. I work with a lot of engineers, for example, and they've expressed interest in this kind of event, but they say, well, I don't know how to program. But, you know, on the other hand, um, one of the problems, I spoke to a researcher who, who's from Southampton, but he works in, in, in a lab in Pakistan, for example, and they're looking for very cheap, uh, high-quality water quality sensors. And, you know, they're just too expensive at the moment. But you can imagine a couple of engineers come in and they sit down for a weekend and try and come up with a design. So I really encourage everybody to attend. It helps if you have some kind of computer science background to help out with the code, but even even if you don't really have that, you know, just to talk with the other people to learn something, maybe you can help scope with the problem, maybe you can help do documentation or testing or, or just give feedback. Or, um. So what sort of commitment does somebody have to make to take part? It's a, a weekend, I think? It's a weekend. So um, typically on the Friday evening before the weekend, there's a social, everybody's free to attend that and just just chat and talk and get to know each other. Uh, Saturday morning starts off with the problem pitches. So every every domain expert, you know, gives a pitch of five, ten minutes, and then people form t teams around the problems and work on it for a whole weekend. On the Sunday afternoon, around three, four, five p.m., uh, everybody prepares a final presentation, and um, there's a bit of judging, and uh, there'll be some, depending on the, the sponsors, there'll be some prizes for the best team. But the whole the whole point is really collaboration, and the you know the, there'll probably be some prizes, but and but the competition is not the main point. It's more the point of you know, let's get together, let's learn from each other, let's learn something new, and let's do something useful. I understand some of the places the hacking carries on overnight, but not here. Uh, well, we did in June, but I got into trouble with the university, um, so uh, I. <laughs> I unfortunately, I'm still trying to organize something, but it looks like between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. we'll have to close doors. But I'm trying to do something about it, but university is, is not being very helpful. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, so what sort of problems did you get proposed at the event in June? Um, so in June we had, so the problem I talked about with the geographer from here, so analyzing satellite images. Um, I had somebody from... Renewable World, which is an energy uh, is an NGO around renewable energy, and uh, I think we'll have that problem again this year. But it was around. So, say if you're a country or a region, and you you, you have a certain energy requirement, 
How do you split that up between renewable sources and non-renewable sources, and which renewable sources you use, and where do you place them? It's kind of an optimization problem, but there's lots of data available and lots of metrics, and how do you aggregate that together into a nice website with sliders and things and, and overlays on a map? And things? So there was that. There was also um, a project called Tarifa, which I initially worked on. It came out of a previous hackathon and then lived on afterwards, uh, which is about civic reporting. So if you live in a, a country or a city where very poor civil, you know, there's very little infrastructure or formal services. So, you know, the, the use case we used was a slum. If, if you live in a slum and there's, and there's a bust pipe somewhere or blocked public toilets, there's no formal way for reporting these issues. So the idea was, okay, um, what if you have a, a very lightweight web-based system? And mobile phones are actually quite pervasive in, in Africa and especially the cheap smartphones. And so imagine you would see the, a, a big problem with a bus pipe. You take a picture of a smartphone, it gets sent to a, a central site, and uh, you, on the receiving side, the, the council would be running the site, and they'd have all these reports come in. And they'd have a nice dashboard with, the, with a map and show where the reports are happening. They'd be able to prioritize them, act on them, um, get, get something fixed. And uh, if, imagine they would fix the broken pipe, for example, that would get, get fed back to the person who actually reported it. You'd be able to get, give feedback. So in a way, similar to fixmystreet.com or Open311, civic reporting, linking citizens with government and, and making that reporting process easier, more streamlined. And uh, so that came out of the sanitation hackathon last year. And uh, I'm very happy to say now it's officially used by the government of uh, Uganda and they, they're using it in, in, in trial projects. So uh, we're looking to expand into Tanzania, hopefully. But so that, that, pro that was uh, in June and will be, people get to work on it again in December as well. I, I was going to ask, you know, how many of these things just finish on the Sunday and nobody ever takes them any further? And, and how many really become something useful and, and, and a, a long life project like that one? Well, I have to be realistic, and I think a lot of the, there's a lot of recent criticism on hackathons as well that you know you come together for a weekend, people do something, and then they just leave, and it, it, nothing really happens. And I think the majority doesn't really. I think the majority never really gains a life beyond that. However, um, there, there is a minority that that do continue. For example, you know the example I just mentioned that uh, continue has a life uh, beyond that. Also. Um, so I don't, it, it's hard to say, but there's always a mind, uh, there's always a couple from every site. There's always one or two projects that are carried forward. It all comes down to the team and how interested they are, how motivated they are. Um, but at least this is also something Rock has recognised uh, since June. For the first time, they've also made available mentorships for the best projects. So, for example, the guys in geography, the, the problem I explained, um, they finished their their thing at the end of the weekend. They sent in this application to Rock for further support to help make their project sustainable. Um, there was only a limited number of, should I say, quote-unquote scholarships, but they managed to get it. And uh, they were assigned a mentoring organization, which in this case was Geeks Without Bounds. And uh, every, I think every month or so, they have a Skype chat and they're followed up and they get support. And it's not monet monetary in this, at this stage. It's, it's more about support and helping you to make your application sustainable. And uh, so they're going through that. So there, there's options. So the majority uh, and usually ends up in a GitHub repository. But you know, there was the experience, and it may, you know, it may inst um, motivate other people. But there are a number of projects which do live on, and the hope is to make that number as large as possible, of course. So if people listening at home have had their interest piqued by some of the things we've talked about today, um, where can they find out more about this event or events across the world? Well, as for Rock, there's a central Rock website, which is rhok.org, rock.org, and it has a list of all the participating cities. It has a full list of problems, and uh, there's all full details and registration there. Um, if for some reason you know you're in a place where there's no event nearby, uh, there's meetup groups like I think it's called Hackathons and Jams. If you search for that on meetup.com, um, you'll find a very long list of events. Um, or if you, you know, if you just Google hackathon or or or, um, um, or, or uh, yeah, I think probably if you look for hackathon, you you just Google around you. There's plenty of events all over the place um, where we can work on this kind of stuff. Cool. And you mentioned sponsors. So who have we got sponsoring this event? 
So the sponsors are there to cover pizza and drinks and such and, and maybe a prize or so, um, though it's not the main focus. In this case, um, I'm happy to say that Google has been kind enough to, to, don to, to sponsor, as well as Microsoft. Um, Microsoft also sponsored last year where they donated a robotics kit for the, for the winning team, and that was really well received, and they'll be doing the same again this year. Um, only just today I've been talking with ATAS, which is uh, a company from... Uh, the west of the UK, which does a lot of research into data mining and, and statistical prediction and things. And they're very interested and it looks like they'll be sponsoring as well. Um, and the university has also been kind enough to help out a bit. Uh, I understand you've got some speakers scheduled for the Saturday, just doing some short talks. Yes. Um, who do you know who's going to be there so far? So currently we have three, three uh, speakers lined up. This is just to kind of break the day a bit and give a bit of background in, into related issues. Um, so, well, Google is sponsoring, so we have somebody coming down from the London Google Development Group who's just going to talk about what they do and their outreach programs and things. Um, we also have somebody from um, Clean Web UK attending, and Clean Web is a, an organization which is, looks at how can we use technology and software and, 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 and such to... to, to um, how can you use that to, to solve problems related to the environment? They're more focused on environmental issues, so you know, green technology and sustainability and that kind of thing. Um, so we have somebody from from Clean Web UK coming down to, to give a, give a short talk about what they're doing as well. They'll probably be pitching a problem as well. And then uh, we have the founder of Crisis Mappers UK, uh, who just lives there, just down the road, and she'll be she'll come down and give a talk about what Crisis Mappers UK, what they do, and, and how you can get involved. Excellent. Well, it sounds like very worthy causes, and I'm sure lots of people will want to get involved and have a good time. And uh, thank you very much indeed for talking to me. Thank you very much. And anybody, if you hear this and you live in the area, I can strongly encourage you to come along. Even if you don't know very much about hacking or, or programming, um, you can do something for the better. It's a great way to learn new people and learn new skills, and I, I can really only recommend it. It's time for the bit about Ubuntu. Woo! I have a cat dribbling on my hand. <laughs> uh, that's not the bit about Ubuntu. Uh, first up in the uh, bit about Ubuntu is uh, the wiki page that's been created for the Nexus 7 build. So if you have a Nexus 7 and you want to have a look and see how the uh, Ubuntu runs on it and uh, contribute to um, getting the core working well, uh, you can go to wiki.ubuntu.com slash Nexus 7. Cool. Excellent. And is that going to be something that, um, you know, is ready for release right now by any chance? How do you mean? As in, you know, it's ready for release, it's ready for consumers just to install. <laughs> yeah, if they yeah. don't mind the fact that you can't press any buttons and there's loads, <laughs> loads of bugs in it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's it's, no, it's not aimed for end users. It's aimed for <sighs> developers to help us get the Ubuntu core working. But oh. I read on the internet that it was ready. <laughs> yeah, you read wrong. Stop. There are not ready. <laughs> the internet was wrong. <laughs> the inter XKCD 386. Someone on the internet was wrong. <laughs> uh, right. Excellent. Okay. There's also news about Victor Palau. Yeah, he's one of the uh, the team who's been working on the Nexus 7, so he's been posting. I, I, I put this in there just so that people could uh, maybe bookmark his, uh, his blog if you're interested in hearing more about uh, um, performance. He's been looking at uh, things like running... Um, browser benchmarks on mm. on the device to see how it works so you know he is he is looking at you know real world usage you know in a, in a browser not just the underlying core stuff as well seeing how responsive it is and so yeah, it's on. interesting that chrome on ubuntu on the nexus 7 outperformed chrome on android on mm. the nexus 7 yeah that was quite <laughs> funny yeah. <laughs> yes isn't it's uh, they're kind of inconclusive results in a way aren't yes. they yeah it's, i think it's there are lies down lies and benchmarks yes, after all exactly not as good as Hugo's random benchmark. No. I ran that on this the other day, actually. Oh, just to see how I compared this. It was, well, a lot better how than my How long did it take to run? Um, oh, I can't remember. I'll, I'll do it in a minute. So for those that don't know, Hugo's random benchmark, Hugo uh, Mills is a member of our, our LUG, and he 
created a ridiculous not a benchmark yes which basically you time how long it takes pearl to count to a billion <laughs> and everyone in the lug decided instantly to run it on all their machines and we now have a page if you search google for hugo random benchmark you'll find a page with loads of thing loads of machines sorted in order of performance <laughs> uh, it's completely ridiculous it doesn't cater for multiple cores or anything like that mm. it's just it's just daft but it's good fun I ran it under Ubuntu on the Nexus 7. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. It, um, I get four and a half seconds. That's pretty good. That's near yeah. the top. That's I, near I the looked top. at the list. I can't, I can't edit the wiki, though. So no, I no nobody, my score nobody can. Yeah. <laughs> it's broken. Um, so it took 33 seconds on the Nexus 7. Uh-huh. Yeah. There cool. You go. There you go. The Electronic Frontier Foundation has posted criticisms on its Deep Links blog over the privacy implications of Ubuntu's new shopping lens. Mm. Ah, yeah. And the privacy implications are ah. it's to do with <laughs> it's to do with the artwork. Although the uh, uh, actual requests for the search terms are proxied, your computer still requests the actual artwork and the images directly from Amazon. Yes. So they could potentially be <sighs> working. It's possible yeah. someone that. could infer yes. they, what they you have, they have for. they have a, they have an interesting screenshot which uh, where someone has searched for a term mm. and while they haven't uh, you know, got some of the results which they might have on their computer returned. They've got um, some related results from Amazon returned. DVD yes. covers. DVD yes. cover. <laughs> yes, and films with a certain word in the title mm. and so right. on. So a lot of those are being fixed. Like uh, the other, earlier on before I, before I drove down here, uh, one of the guys in the loco suggested I search for a particular type of soup. It's called cocker leaky soup. Right. Uh, suggested I search for that because when he searched the other day, it popped up some um, unwanted stuff. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you yeah, know, not cocker leaky soup. Uh, that is a genuine soup, by the way. Was, was it mulligatawny <laughs> soup? <laughs> Gazpacho. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Hot soup action. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, but it, it was fine. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, the point is that it's not perfect. There are bugs in it, yeah. and um, yeah, some yeah. of them are being worked on. And uh, at the bottom of the article, there's a list of what EFF wants from Ubuntu, mm -hmm. uh, which including disabling the online search results by default, mm -hmm. uh, explaining what happens to search queries and IP addresses, mm -hmm. uh, making the search results tab of the privacy tab let users toggle on and off specific online search results right. rather than it being a, it's a global yeah, switch rather yeah. being online stuff or not online stuff um but it does give them some sort of um sort of compliments for actually you know taking the biting the bullet as it were and doing yeah. new stuff yes. yes but not in the way that they've done it essentially basically. well the thing is uh, you know all of the things that the eff raised we already knew there's mm. there there was nothing in it that was you know oh my god it's leaking my passport passwords or anything like it's a, not. A massively alarming there it was all stuff we already knew about we have bugs filed about yeah. whether yes. we're going to fix them or not i don't know i mean some of them are are tricky ones for us to deal with like you know revealing how we deal with ip addresses on the back end systems and we have to talk to our internal is people about that kind of stuff but you know there's nothing that kind of leapt off the page it wasn't mm -hmm. as alarming as people make it out to be yes it was the eff and yes they've chosen to have a look at it but that that makes sense it's the kind mm -hmm. of thing they look at and you know it's good that they did because it was a pretty comprehensive well-written article mm. cool cool and finally in the bit about Ubuntu, the canonical design team heard you like design so they've redesigned their design blog so now you can read about design with a new design excellent it looks really nice They've got pictures of themselves. Yeah, they've got loads of pictures of themselves. <laughs> nice pictures of themselves. Not pictures of themselves like you would see from, oh, I don't know, the post-UDS party. <laughs> <laughs> These are all What were you dressed nice as headshots. this time? Uh, me. Oh, we, we all went as Vikings. I was going to say, what? We had a big it? box of Viking helmets, and the bus that took us there was a Viking buses, and we booked out a bar in Copen central Copenhagen called something McGee's or something for the whole night and the band played and we did some karaoke there are photos online of this i think i saw one or two photos of karaoke yes it was good fortunately fun. no sound it's in nice that. nice way to unwind at the end of uds very disappointed the design blog doesn't have a single pair of orange sunglasses <laughs> uh, hmm. not even and it doesn't even show people One. using a Mac. Exactly. <laughs> it can't possibly be right. How will they maintain their credibility <laughs> with the community? And uh, finally, in the not about Ubuntu, 
Linus Torvalds has posted a brief review of KDE on his Google Plus page. He describes the overall look as cartoony and criticised some of the default settings, such as desktop widgets displaying configuration controls when moused over. He summed up that he was mildly amused by the sheer whimsicality of it all. (laughs) I'm sure that was taken in the spirit in which it was meant. Well, yeah, I, I kind of agree with him. You know, I've always thought KDE looks a bit like a bad shareware app from 1990. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's just my personal opinion. What Absolutely. do you think, Mark? Um, I don't think that he was wrong in many of the things he said. It doesn't mean that I don't still like KDE. <laughs> but, I mean, you yeah, like things, like, things like, yeah, there, you, you, there are some widgets on the desktop by default. And when you mouse over them, even if you're just trying to use the widget, it will pop out with move this, rotate it an arbitrary amount, or <laughs> configure it, when, generally speaking, when you put your mouse over it, you put your mouse over it to use it, not to move it around. So, yeah, mm. I see his point. But, but then uh, the flip side of that is we have notifications <laughs> that you put your mouse over and you can't click on them. You can't do anything with them. Your laptop is being thoroughly licked. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> And now it's time for your feedback. One Stuart Ward pointed out this to us. I was looking at QR codes and I came up with this wonderful command. It displays the date as a QR code, so you'll need to get out your phone and use the barcode reader to see what the time is. (laughs) And you could even put this in a loop so that the current time is always displayed in a format not readable by humans. So I tried it. We'll put the actual command on the website. Um, I tried it and it flashes up... uh, QR code for a second. So I I <laughs> hacked it and changed the one to, <laughs> to a, a five. five. Whoa, you are so, leaked. I know. So then it actually stood on the screen for five seconds, which was gave that, me... Was t- that long enough for your phone which to gave focus me time on to, it? <laughs> yeah. Well, one second, I was just like, oh, gee. <laughs> Trying so to get my phone out. What practical applications does this undoubtedly wonderful thing have? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Correct answer. I see. <laughs> Kevin O'Brien emailed to ask for a volunteer. Ohio Linux Fest is looking for someone to step up and take on the role of volunteer coordinator. No previous experience is required. This could be a great opportunity for someone who would like to be involved with a major event and help give back to the open source community. If anyone is interested, please email news at ohiolinux.org. Step to it, people. Faye left a comment on our website to say, Is MS Windows 8 a good opportunity for Ubuntu or any other willing distro to try and capitalise on? Yes. With Win 8 looking so different to its predecessors, could it be a chance to market to the masses? Yes. Something along the lines of, if you have to change, make it a good change. Insert distro name here. Ubuntu. (laughs) Well, they've already done that, really, with the whole Windows 8. I mean, there's more to do. Keep reinforcing that message. But it's uh, not a trick that Ubuntu has missed. Yes. Indeed. With the whole don't jump to Windows 8, jump to Ubuntu mm. thing. The what? The what? What? The thing on the website. The thing on the website that wasn't on the website for very long. Was it not? Was it no. gone? <laughs> it went, yeah. Uh, it wasn't a very Ubuntu thing. What? Uh, it's a bit negative campaign, isn't it? was it? a bit, yeah. It wasn't a very Ubuntu thing, mm. so it got removed. Oh. Mm. With, <laughs> I if, think it was avoid the was pain this, of Windows 8, wasn't yeah. it? <laughs> That's still, did it, did I, it last longer than PayPal on the donation page? I don't know. <laughs> Is that gone? I, I took a screenshot of that avoid, because I thought it was quite funny, avoid the pain of Windows 8, shared it on Google+, Plus. it's like the single most shared thing I've ever had. Like <laughs> two and a half thousand people shared it, and then like a minute later it was taken down from the website. So yeah. All because of you. Yeah, Not probably. a fan of squares. Come to Ubuntu. <laughs> etc. Pagoff emailed to say, I noted during your program this week that you raised the question of Ubuntu replacing Windows. I have both on my computer, but I find myself forced to use Windows for the DRM stuff, syncing my iPod, iPad, Netflix and other streaming, and using the downloads of audiobooks and ebooks from my library. Here's a clue. Don't buy DRM encumbered formats and you won't have that problem. Uh, yeah, but... Um, pa- uh, Richard S, sorry, in our IRC channel, I just wanted to make sure I got his name correct, has been saying something similar. He's a win- <laughs> Richard S. Richard, uh, Richard not, Matthew S. Not Richard Stallman. Uh, <laughs> Richard our- underscore S underscore. 
in, in our uh, C channel has been saying that he's been trying to move, but I was interested in moving back to Linux, having tried it about four years ago. Currently a Windows user, and uh, you know would like to be able to use his iPod and you know GPS and things like that. And it's uh, not an unreasonable request to uh, to make. Yeah, totally right. And he's a World of Warcraft fan as well, so he can't use that properly under Linux. Doesn't that work under Wine? Um, I thought. Apparently, Pretty yes, sure a bit. Mm. Um, so yeah. But yeah, an interesting question, and it's one of those things that doesn't seem to go away, unfortunately. Uh, it slowly goes away, but yeah, it takes time. Yeah. And we've had this voicemail. Hello, this is Steven, your counterpart in the Ohio Loco. There's so many things I could say, but I'll leave it at this. In episode 5-18, around the ecosphere, what was that rattling? Did someone have a baby rattle? Was there a tambourine practice going on? Did a dog or a cat have a new bell on? What was that in the background of the podcast? Am I the only one who noticed it? Did you even notice hearing it? Wondering mind. Have a great show. And remember, guys, it's election day in the USA. So I'm not listening live. I'm a little bit occupied. Have a great day, guys. What was the noise? It was the podcats. It was one of the podcats, the one that that's just been licking Alan's laptop, I think. <laughs> or possibly the one that's now asleep with her head on the mixer controls. <laughs> this is what we work yeah, with. We, we have cats in the studio every week. Yeah. How Trust, do they get in here? If we lock them out, they just make even more noise out of the True. back. True. Or, you know, potentially bring in things. Still, it's better than a dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> it's more melodic than a dishwasher. Um, but yes. Oh, and uh, yeah. So good luck with all our American listeners um, with the elections today. Make sure you yeah. vote. Vote Bartlett. That's my motto. <laughs> and uh, okay. Oh, two blank staring faces. <laughs> West Wing. Go, no. go. Is that a thing on the telly? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was. <laughs> That's all for this episode. Thank you for listening. You can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, where you can find our voicemail numbers in Twitter feed, Facebook, and Google Plus pages, and IRC channel. Let us know what you think of the show, uh, or give us your thoughts about Ubuntu and the community around it. Join us on Tuesday the 20th of November for our next live broadcast. Indeed you do. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. What have we got lined up for then? Who's going to be there? We've got an interview. Me. Yeah, I think I will. Yeah. You think? Ooh, an interview. Yeah. Mm. That's have unusual. We? Yeah. Well, we haven't got an interview. We will do an interview. Oh, so it could all will. fall through, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't usually. No. Actually, I've got another interview lined up. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Interview-tastic. Then we might not need to be here at all. Awesome. <laughs> and we're, we're not, we not just long just Christmas it either. <gasps> can we replace you with a bot that does yes. all this? A if small shell Yeah, because that worked well before. Right. Bye-bye, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>